Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest in the IEFA conversation series. My name is Riley Griffin, and I'm a healthcare and pharmaceuticals reporter with Bloomberg News. And I am joined today by Robert Bradway, the chairman and CEO of Amgen. Robert, it is a pleasure to speak with you once again. You sit at the helm of one of the world's leading biotechnology companies. The current pandemic has certainly put healthcare at the center of attention for governments and corporations alike. It's also drawn the attention of folks who are not as closely familiar with the ins and outs of drug development. What has it been like to lead Amgen through the tumultuous waters of the pandemic and ensuing market volatility? And, and tell me, how has COVID-19 disrupted or changed your business? Well, first, Riley, let me say it's nice to be here with you today. So thanks for having me and I uh, look forward to our discussion. Uh, it, it has obviously been a period uh, unlike any other in our company's 40 year history. Um, you know, the pandemic arose uh, on the scene seemingly out of nowhere. Uh, and yet in less than 12 months, um, I think uh, we've been able to break the back of uh, this virus, reveal many of the secrets that it uh, seemed to be holding when we first encountered it um, uh, at the beginning of last year. Uh, and I'm actually feeling pretty optimistic about where we are. I think the, the idea that we would have at this point, not one, not two, but several vaccines with the levels of efficacy and safety that have been reported in the data so far, I think is a staggering accomplishment and a reflection of just what an extraordinary window we're in for biology and biotechnology. Uh, so I think the previous record for a vaccine development prior to this was something like four years. And so you can imagine uh, that if we'd had to wait another three years for a vaccine, what our lives uh, would have been like in managing uh, through SARS-CoV-2. But we don't have to wait. The vaccines are here. They're being produced abundantly. Uh, as I've already said, the data for them looks spectacular. Uh, so I think we can see a light at the end of the tunnel. And it's not just vaccines, but it's uh, monoclonal antibodies as well. And we're delighted to be partnering with Lilly to help manufacture neutralizing uh, antibodies at scale which have been shown in clinical trials to uh, substantially reduce the risk of hospitalization for people who have uh, been infected with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and then in addition, there are a number of other products. Of course, there's the antiviral from remdesivir from, from Gilead, and there are a variety of other products that have demonstrated efficacy uh, in the battle against this virus. So you know, considering that 12 months ago, we had nothing in the way of a vaccine, we had no antivirals that worked against the therapy, no idea what other products might be useful in this fight. Uh, I think we, uh, as an industry, have had an extraordinary 12 months. And I think that reflects the fact that it's been all hands on deck. Uh, so even mm -hmm. companies like, uh, like ours that don't have a history in infectious disease or in antiviral search have been very engaged. Uh, and that's true virtually across the uh, biotech ecosystem. So academic labs, government labs, industry labs, companies large and small. And it's been exciting to watch. And um, I'd also say, Riley, that, um, you know, again, when all of us began last year uh, with our plans for 2020, none of us had any idea uh, the scale of disruption that was in front of us. And I'm incredibly proud of my colleagues for how they adapted and uh, how they made sure that our supply chains didn't stumble. So we were able to provide products to patients who needed them. Um, wherever they needed them and whenever they needed them. So uh, there really were some heroic adaptations uh, across our business. And I'm sure that's true uh, really across our industry. So, you know, touch wood, it's been uh, an incredibly challenging year, but I think uh, also an incredibly rewarding year uh, for all of us in the industry, all of us who believe in innovation uh, as the way forward. You said that it's been all hands on deck and we've certainly noticed many a cross industry collaboration cropping up to fight the pandemic. I'm curious if you see that phenomenon here to stay where, where manufacturers will lend their additional capacity to those developing say vaccines or in your case, monoclonal antibodies, if that's something that we'll see a trend post pandemic. Well, um, I don't know how much um, capacity sharing we'll see, for example, for monoclonal antibodies. And I can't really speak to mm -hmm. um, that uh, question as it relates to the vaccines per se. Uh, but what, what I, I think the all hands on deck and the cooperative spirit reflects is how this industry has operated for decades. So mm -hmm. 
we have a, a history as an industry of collaborating with uh, one another, companies large and small collaborating across the therapeutic waterfront, um, helping each other discover, uh, develop, uh, market, and in some cases, manufacture um, uh, medicines for one another. So you know, we're in a period of incredibly exciting, um, uh, really a revolution of information in biology. Uh, and it's impossible for any one company in the ecosystem uh, to, to master all of the information that's arising. And so I think that we will continue to see close collaboration. Um, and I think that collaboration has probably been fostered as a result of the COVID-19 experience. Um, and, you know, again, I think that'll be true academic to corporate and, you know, corporate large, corporate small, uh, venture backed um, uh, government as well. So I think we, we will see uh, plenty of it. I think it will have been encouraged and helped by the experience of COVID-19. Uh, so again, it's a really exciting time uh, to be trying to champion innovation. And I would just say, Riley, that you know the ecosystem uh, for innovation in our industry was strong before COVID-19. And I think it will have been strengthened as a result of the experience of the pandemic. Perhaps one of the most striking lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic will be the need to continue investing in disease prediction and prevention. What do you think that both the private and public sector can do to be better prepared for the next health crisis? Well, I think that's a really important topic. And I think prediction and prevention applies not just to pandemics, uh, but to other diseases, particularly chronic diseases. So I hope we'll have a moment to talk about that. But you know, th throughout my adult life, uh, we've been talking about the risk of there being a pandemic. Um, you know, our uh, grandparents or those who were around at the early uh, stages of the 20th century lived through, of course, the Spanish flu. Uh, and we have faced, um, you know, for our generation, we have faced the prospect of being exposed to a virus like that, uh, that none of us who are living today have immunity to. Uh, and so we've known that there was a risk of a pandemic. Um, we didn't know that it was going to be a coronavirus. Uh, we didn't know that it was going to arise in late 2019 or early 2020, but we've known that that risk existed. Uh, and, you know, fortunately, I think uh, we've put some infrastructure in place globally, the Sentinel networks, for example, uh, the backbone for tracking uh, influenza-like symptoms in this country, for example, uh, which served us very well. But I think we also learned uh, from this pandemic that there are some things that we don't have in place that would probably be important for us to put in place so that uh, if and when, and I think it's really more a question of when, the next um, uh, virus uh, uh, reaches the globe and becomes a pandemic, uh, we're better prepared to respond to it. And so that would include some of the manufacturing mm. uh, that we found to be lacking at the early stages of, of this pandemic, you know, for example, around the personal protective equipment or around ventilators. Uh, and I think also in, you know, in the manufacturing of medicines and um, uh, vaccines and antibodies, there's probably some merit in thinking about how we keep a certain amount of capacity available uh, for pandemics. But, you know, by and large, um, again, I think we adapted as a community very rapidly uh, to uh, the pandemic. And um, again, I'm optimistic that uh, we can see some light at the end of the tunnel now. But, I, you know, I, I hope that we'll come away from this, from this with some lessons for what could be done better next time. You mentioned some some headwinds posed to the manufacturing process. Are there specific pieces of the overarching supply chain that you think need additional investment, whether that's in terms of creating active ph pharmaceutical ingredients or pharmaceutical grade glass, syringes, et cetera? Um, where are those pressure points that you think deserve additional attention? Well, I think it's at a higher altitude than that, Riley. I think the issue is that all of us who are running companies uh, are optimizing our individual supply chains for the demands uh, that exist and the demands that we anticipate for our products globally. Um, and none of us are running our supply chains with the prospect that we might have to supply six or seven billion people on the planet with some good in a short period of time. So none of us are carrying enough excess capacity to be able to uh, change on a dime uh, and begin producing at the scale that was required in the early stages of a pandemic. It would be woefully inefficient for a company to try to run its supply chain organizations in that way. So I think if we were to conclude that, that we wanna have certain capacity available, you know, we might need to uh, rely on you know, public-private partnerships or 
um, some form of, uh, of you know, government partnership, which we have in place, for example, uh, in the biodefense area and bioterrorism area. So there are precedents that we could follow. Uh, and those precedents um, exist also to some extent in the vaccine manufacturing area. Uh, and you know, I think that that's probably um, the thread that we ought to pull and try to figure out um, you know, what capacity would serve us well uh, in the future. Certainly antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, mm -hmm. and having manufacturing capacity available for that uh, would be a useful example. And then again, I think on the PPE front, the respirators, the, uh, the ventilators, the, you know, the protective masks, I think we've learned as well that we may need to think differently about inventorying supplies like that. Fascinating. You know, we're talking quite a bit about infectious disease, but let's shuttle out for a moment and discuss some of the growth drivers that are core to Amgen, which has an ever-expanding biosimilar portfolio, has recently acquired a Tesla, and a highly anticipated experimental cancer drug, Sotorasib and Tezepelumab. That's right, Riley. Those are uh, two innovative first-in-class molecules. In fact, both of those have breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA, which is pretty unusual for a company to have two molecules uh, being advanced at the same moment that have breakthrough therapy designation. But, you know, that reflects uh, our commitment to advancing innovative uh, first-in-class molecules for serious disease. And, you know, if you look across our portfolio, you see, you'll see that we've done it over and again, whether it's Repatha or antibody to PCSK9 for high cholesterol, uh, whether it's Prolia or antibody against the rank ligand for osteoporosis, uh, we have been at the, at the vanguard of a number of important biologic innovations through our 40-year history, and, and we're trying to keep up that track record now with sotoracid and tezepelumab. And sotoracid is an interesting story because it's a, a molecule that's designed to target um, a, an oncogene, a mutation that's been known for some time in cancer, but had been considered undruggable. Uh, and so when we uh, were able to successfully drug that target, it represented the first time in 40 years of, of trying to, to do that, uh, that a therapy uh, demonstrated safety and efficacy for those patients who have uh, a mutation uh, known as KRAS G12C. So it represents a real breakthrough in the field. And I think it's a source of optimism and excitement for those who believe that, again, we're at the dawn of a really exciting era of innovation in oncology. And similarly, tezepelumab, that is, a, again, a brand new uh, approach to trying to treat, in this case, severe uncontrolled asthma. Uh, and it's a molecule for which we've demonstrated efficacy and, uh, and safety uh, in patients across the spectrum of severe uncontrolled asthma. And, and the, the exciting thing there is that uh, the spectrum that I'm referring to includes patients who have a low eosinophil count. Uh, and other biologic medicines haven't been able to demonstrate a similar effect for those patients. So this offers um, you know, a significant number of patients a new option, a new way to control uh, their severe, otherwise uncontrolled asthma. And can you provide our, our viewers with a little bit of a regulatory timeline, your expectations for when there is a potential to come to market with both those, those assets? Well, Sotoracid is on file now with regulators around the world, and we have um, a variety of different um, PDUFA dates or, or the dates that we expect the regula regulators to take an action. Uh, but most recently, the US FDA established August as the uh, action date for that molecule. So we'll look forward to, to uh, their decision, uh, and we'll be ready to launch that for patients. Um, who have that mutation and who have been told that, uh, that there's help coming because we believe there is help coming. And, and tezepelumab, we've uh, reported that we'll be submitting the data to regulators for that molecule uh, at the end or second half of this year. And again, we're anxiously assembling the appropriate regulatory files now, and we look forward to having that on a file just as soon as humanly possible. You called for additional funding for, for spaces in infectious disease and parts of the supply chains and manufacturing, of course. When it comes to chronic disease, do you think that there are particular health areas that have also been underfunded by both the public and private sector and would like to demand more? Well, um, what I would say, Riley, is just as you said, uh, it's probably time to uh, use a bit more prediction and prevention when it comes to mm. uh, epidemics. I think there's an opportunity for us to do that in, in you know, chronic diseases like heart disease or, or even osteoporosis. And you know, if you think for a minute of the terrible, tragic toll 
uh, of COVID over the past year. I think we've now crossed the threshold of some 500,000 people in our country having died from that disease. It's a, an extraordinary toll, an unacceptable toll. And yet when we think about heart disease, we know that some 600 plus thousand people uh, will die of, of heart disease in the next 12 months. So I think there are two questions we should ask ourselves about those people. First, can we predict which of our fellow citizens are uh, at greatest risk of, of heart disease and having a heart attack or stroke? And the answer is yes, absolutely. We have the tools available to predict um, who's at risk. And then we need to ask, do we have the tools available to prevent uh, those diseases from happening? You know, and I think we do. Uh, so it's unfortunate we have a healthcare system that's rather more oriented to fixing things that are broken. So the kicking into action after the heart attack or after the stroke. Well, that's not, we don't need to operate that way. Um, we have the ability to predict who's at risk. We have the therapies available to prevent those risks from uh, coming to the fore. And we should be trying to do that. You know, the same is true in, in osteoporosis. You know, it's still extraordinary you know, for me to accept that uh, there are 400,000 plus women in our country every year who have a fracture due to uh, osteoporosis, many, many of which could be prevented by appropriate therapy. So we have the tools. Um, we have the ability to, to identify those who are at greatest risk. We just have to have the will uh, to confront these chronic diseases and to do something about it. And, you know, maybe we'll be fortunate that uh, the pandemic has catalyzed all of us uh, to recognize the value of innovation uh, and perhaps in all of us, you know, desire to not let uh, diseases that can be prevented um, uh, proceed. Uh, so, you know, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, uh, but, you know, I'm most encouraged by the fact that there are incredibly exciting drugs uh, advancing through clinical pipelines like arsodoracid and artezapelumab for cancer and, and asthma. Uh, but I don't want us to take our eye off uh, those medicines like Empatha for cardiovascular disease, Prolia for osteoporosis, or Tesla for mild to moderate uh, psoriasis, and you know, many other molecules or medicines like those. And tell me, what does Amgen's investment and involvement look like in that first half of what you just described, the prediction side of the industry? Well, you know, Amgen has made a very big commitment to the field of human genetics. In fact, we I think we're the world's leaders in using uh, human genetics to understand disease and to try to identify pathways that are relevant for disease. So we're investing a considerable amount every year uh, in genetics or genomics. Um, we think that, uh, again, we can learn about a disease by studying at the, at the level of the uh, fundamental level of the nucleotide uh, in humans. And we think that in doing that, we ought to be able to improve our success rate for identifying uh, ways to, to prevent uh, diseases from developing in people who are born with um, a, a, a risk of those diseases developing over time. So in addition to what we're doing in genetics, we're also running one of the largest ever, if not the largest ever, proteomics experiment, which we will pair with our genetic information to see whether we can, again, glean additional insights around why chronic diseases develop in the first place uh, and how we can prevent them from becoming so bad that they cause the uh, diseases that we've been talking about, like heart attacks and strokes and, and uh, diabetes, obesity, liver disease. Uh, and so some three quarters of our pipeline now away from our oncology molecules uh, are um, uh, drugs that we uh, have a reason to believe, thanks to human genetics, will make a difference uh, in people. And then, of course, in cancer, we're very focused on uh, therapies that are targeted at specific molecular genetic mutations like the one I've already referred to, uh, KRAS G12C. So that's very much part of, um, of our strategy and uh, part of the portfolio that we've built uh, at Amgen. And you know, to, to directly answer your question, we're investing about uh, four and a quarter billion dollars now in, in research and development. And um, you know, much of that is directed at uh, predicting uh, uh, and trying to personalize therapies for those who will most benefit from them. Another part of the portfolio is a subsidiary called Decode, which has been gathering quite a bit of data around the coronavirus. I wonder if you could tell us, share with us a little bit more about what kind of data it's collecting and how that could be used. Yeah, so uh, Decode is our human genetics subsidiary based in Iceland. Um, and uh, Decode very early in the pandemic recognized that by virtue of the population on the island of Iceland, uh, they had an opportunity to study the virus 
uh, in a way that would be difficult elsewhere in the world. So uh, they've engaged in a very comprehensive longitudinal molecular epidemiology. So they're studying, studying the virus uh, in those who are infected in Iceland, sequencing the virus, which means they're reading the, um, the nucleotides um, for each of the individuals who's been infected, trying to understand the variants of the virus, trying to understand the effect of the variants uh, on the course of the disease, trying to understand whether there are things in the human host that can explain why some people become sick uh, mm -hmm. when others don't seem to be as badly affected by the virus. So we have the opportunity to capitalize on the incredible uh, generous spirit of the Icelandic people uh, to be willing to have, uh, again, their viruses and to be willing to have their uh, genetics studied to see what more we can learn for the benefit of those off the island. So it's been an incredibly uh, exciting and rewarding journey and it's led to the publications of some important papers. Um, and I know our team is looking forward to continuing to contribute um, as this pandemic unfolds and hopefully you know, as we uh, turn it into an endemic or maybe even something better than that, uh, turn it into an, el an eliminated uh, virus, but that's still some way down the road. As we see so many new technologies validated by this pandemic. I keep hearing the term renaissance used to describe the future of biotech innovation. Um, what kind of technologies are you following at the moment and how will the biopharmaceutical industry change in the wake of this pandemic, do you think? Well, I don't know, Riley, if I would use renaissance, I would use revolution. You know, I think <laughs> we're in the early days of, of uh, a century that will one day be known as the bio century. And you see that playing out every day um, as we come to better understand this virus and come to better develop therapies to address it, uh, better able to keep people from becoming uh, seriously ill from it. So, you know, there, there is a revolution uh, occurring daily in our understanding of biology. And I think the world is getting to see that through the lens of the pandemic. The world is getting to read every day uh, about the, you know, the new insights that we're gleaning about um, this virus. But the, the bigger picture is that that's happening really across the, uh, the landscape of biology. So whether it's cancer, whether it's cardiovascular disease, whether it's inflammation, uh, you know, we're, we're making breakthroughs as a community of innovators uh, every day. Um, that's very, very exciting. So I'd say it's a revolution. Um, you know, it's propelled by uh, the capital that has been deployed in trying to study the fundamentals of biology. It's also being aided, of course, by the incredible a digital revolution. So mm -hmm. we're able as a result of that to, to study data in quantities that are uh, providing insights that we wouldn't have had without those technologies. Uh, so it's been a very productive uh, period of time. And I, again, I think you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, you know, we're still going to be talking about a very rapid rate of progress being made against some of these scourges that still afflict us on the globe. And what do you see as the reputational impact on the industry in light of this very productive period of time where folks who perhaps never watched biopharmaceutical development in action um, are now evaluating its impact? Well, um, I hope that people will emerge from this experience with a respect for the capabilities of the innovative biotechnology or biopharmaceutical industry, particularly in this country. Um, you know, we are the world's leaders in biotechnology. Um, this country has, has had decades of leadership in, in biotechnology, and I think that's because we have an ecosystem um, that, that works in a way that doesn't exist elsewhere in the world. And that ecosystem includes corporations like Amgen, it includes venture-backed uh, startups, it includes uh, academic labs, it includes government-funded research. Uh, and by integrating all those things, we've been able to generate the kind of uh, advances that we've talked about already today for COVID-19. Uh, and I hope that people uh, will have a, a newfound perhaps awareness or uh, awareness and respect for uh, the importance of that innovation and the quality of it. Uh, so, you know, when you look at the, at the things that, that challenge us as a society today, um, again, I wanna come back to heart disease. In the, United, in the United States alone, we spend $600 billion a year uh, on heart disease. We don't need to spend that much money on a disease that we can predict and prevent as well as we can uh, cardiovascular problems. So, you know, I'm hopeful uh, that when we think about what ails the healthcare system in the United States, we recognize that what we need is more innovation, not less. Uh, and we need to be 
uh, allocating resources to the innovation that makes a difference for patients. And what better way to make a difference than to prevent somebody from having a serious disease like a heart attack or a stroke, or to prevent a woman from falling and fracturing her hip after retirement. Um, so, you know, these are the kinds of things that, again, I, I hope that uh, people will recognize, you know, there's a role for innovation in our society. There are plenty of diseases uh, which require better medicines than those that are available today. Uh, we got to stick at it. We've got to continue to invest uh, substantially, heavily in innovative research and development. And I think the fruits of that labor will be improved health care and hopefully quality of life and life expectancy, not just here in the United States, but around the world. In terms of pent up demand for some of these products, are you expecting a continued recovery to parts of the, the business as the vaccine rollout continues to unfold and people start visiting doctors' offices again? At sure, no, no question, the, the vaccine rollout will help. And again, I'm, I'm encouraged that we're making progress every day on that. And you know, it starts with the seniors and the elderly population. Those are the populations, or that is the population that's most afflicted by chronic disease. Uh, and so the good news is, uh, the vaccines have been prioritized in that cohort of our uh, uh, fellow citizenry. Uh, and I think as that community is, is vaccinated and feels immunized against the virus, they will be able to return more comfortably to the doctors and resume visits that otherwise would have happened. But I think on the order of a third of, of the American families postponed or canceled the doctor's visit over the last 12 months that would otherwise have happened. So um, we, the good news is that will start to improve. It has not fully recovered. Uh, so you know, here we are in the first quarter of 2021, and clearly the level of activity as reflected in patient-doctor interactions, as reflected in diagnostic testing, uh, has not returned to what it was in 2019. Uh, so we still have some room to go, but we're making progress. And with every passing day, with every incremental vaccination, I think it'll get better. That's great to hear. You know, an another disparity that has been thrust into the limelight um, amid the pandemic is one in terms of access to treatment and specific challenges that certain communities face when it comes to healthcare, whether it's getting drugs or access to diagnostics. Um, what can we do to fix this situation moving forward? Well, I think if you were referring specifically to the healthcare disparity problems that we have in our country, Riley, mm -hmm. yeah, I think again, uh, COVID has shined a um, you know, a spotlight uh, on an ugly truth in our country. And the truth is that we, we still have healthcare disparities uh, in our communities. Uh, we have healthcare disparity, for example, in heart disease for our uh, Black or African American colleagues. We also have it for our Asian um, uh, fellow citizens. And so um, we have to recognize that we saw it in COVID. We saw that certain uh, segments of our population were more vulnerable uh, to COVID, disproportionately suffered from it. So we need to understand what the root causes are there, and we need to first accept that, that those disparities are real, second, commit to doing something about it, um, and you know, commit to that by trying to understand fundamentally what is it? Is it the uh, quality of the service being provided? Is it fundamental biology that we don't understand? Whatever it is, we need to understand it and come to grips with it. So we're involved in that as a company. We're uh, very active in trying to improve the diversity of of people enrolled in our clinical trials. So for example, um, making concerted efforts to enroll uh, blacks in our clinical trials so as to address some of these questions and see if we can better understand um, the health disparity that has existed for decades in cardiovascular disease. We're also doing that, for example, uh, with Asians and uh, trying to better understand um, how uh, the biology of our medicines works uh, across all uh, you know, people in our population. So uh, we have focused efforts on that as a company. As I said, um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that our industry does as well. And I think there's a growing awareness in our community aided by the experience of 2020 and, and the evidence of injustice and, and lack of equal opportunity that we were all seeing on our television screens uh, earlier in 2020. I think catalyzed in part by that, um, there's a real groundswell now to try to tackle some of these health disparities. What a great point to, to leave us on. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Bradway, and thank you to our viewers for joining us. I hope that you stay well, stay healthy um, amid these times. Okay, thank you, Riley.